Hey everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining in from. Uh, my name is Andy. Uh, I'll be one of the panelists today for uh, the intro to the Simgrip Supply Chain webinar. Um, so today, obviously, I'll be talking about Simgrip Supply Chain, product that I, I helped launch. Uh, so we'll be talking about how it works, what it is, all that good jazz. But I actually want to make sure before we dive into that, we take some time to go into the context. So what I mean by that is I want to bring you along our product journey and really show you the motivation for why we built this, you know. Uh, I think the question always is, we don't want to just build a shiny new tool that we want we want folks to use. We want to really tell you, hey, these are the problems that we've been seeing in the space that just demanded action, that just got a startup uh, to put in a bunch of effort into building this out. So uh, if there's anything to take away from this webinar, I hope it's that folks can get a real sense of the problem here and why it's such an urgent issue. So without further ado, uh, let's just jump right in. Little background about me. Uh, I'm Andy. I'm one of the product managers here uh, at SEMGRAPT. Uh, I got my bachelor's in CS from UCLA and I joined SEMGRAPT shortly after. And I'm on the SEMGRAPT supply chain team. Uh, quick fun fact I used to be a competitive swimmer in California. Uh, my main events were the 100 meter breaststroke and the 100 meter butterfly. Cool. So a quick agenda today. I mentioned earlier, Wana takes a step back to really talk about the context and the whole state of vulnerability management in third-party packages, and then really try to uh, take a stab at how are you actually solving these problems for your organizations with existing tools out there. Then I'll love to go into our product, and the main points to drive there are really just about this nifty concept called reachability and how it works and what the value is. And then lastly, going into a demo where I'll go through some typical workflows, how you'd engage with the product, whether you're an AppSec, a uh, security engineer or a developer, and then we'll wrap everything up with uh, a Q&A uh, with however much time we have left after the webinar. So I'm sure folks will have questions. Please drop them down in the chat, and uh, myself or anyone from the SEMGRIP side will answer uh, at the end of this webinar. Cool. So yeah, let's get things uh, started with just a quick poll. I I'd love to hear whether you're a CISO, a developer, a security engineer, how often are your third-party packages upgraded to the latest version? I, to be fair, uh, I have a hunch for what people might answer. So, uh, but I'd be curious to see what people uh, actually end up saying. So we'll give a few moments for folks to answer and uh, look at the results. Cool. Okay, so while that poll is coming in, I think I'll just jump right into the next slide. So my hunch, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, my hunch is that I think most folks rarely or never even have all their third party packages upgraded to the latest one. And that's okay. That's a consequence of how widespread open source uh, software usage is today. 90% of your software is importing other libraries and reusing and not reinventing the wheel. So that's okay. Where I think the interesting part is, is that a consequence of having so many open source packages is that there's an overwhelming amount of open vulnerabilities when you scan with and you know, any random SCA tool. If you take a look in 2021 alone, NVD reported over 20,000 plus CVEs. And you know, even if you filter down to the languages, the ecosystems, the tech stack that's relevant to you, you'll still get vulnerabilities in the thousands, right? And that's that's insane. That's crazy. That's so much. In one survey that Cisco did with uh, Kenna Security, uh, in the survey, half of the organizations that in the study only had 15% of their vulnerabilities remediated. So that leaves a lot left to be desired you are only fixing 15%, you have 85% left. Clearly there's something wrong with like either the things that are being surfaced or you know, it's just really hard to manage and triage everything. So what we've noticed and heard from users is that they typically go through a pretty uncomfortable prioritiz prioritization exercise. You have a giant list of thousands of vulnerabilities and for each one, you kind of go through this motion of asking yourself these, you know, a generic set of questions. Is this exploitable? Am I exposing PII? 
uh, are the CVS scores reported on this even accurate? Is a critical actually a critical? And the biggest question of all is, is fixing this actually going to hurt developer velocity, break anything? How do I manage everything? And so for every single vulnerability that is being flagged in one of your traditional SCA tools, you're just constantly going through this motion and that's just painful. That's just super time consuming. We've heard time and time again from users that this is not a problem that they want to focus on, especially because AppSec security programs are more than just that. You know, if you're a small company, you're probably in the process of getting your SOC 2 or ISO. If you're in a regulatory environment, you probably need to deal with FedRAMP and making sure you're compliant there. And then cloud security and internal security is just a challenge for anyone and everyone as they scale their company. So really the takeaway here is there's so many questions and so many things you go through as you see a giant list of vulnerabilities. So how can you actually you know, deal with that? You don't want to triage everything. So there are lots of free tools out there currently today that try to tackle this problem with dependency management, right? Uh, so some are specific to your package manager, some are specific to your source code management tools, uh, and they all have their pros and cons depending on how your code, uh, code base is set up. But what we've noticed for most of these tools is they just check to see if you're importing a package and version against the CVE, but they don't actually give you any additional context for prioritization. So going back to these questions about like, you know, are these scores accurate? Is anything exposed? Is this exploitable? Uh, a lot of these tools don't necessarily give you that context. You have to manually dig into them and that's really where all the time suck is. You'll spend 30, 40 minutes, sometimes even longer, just trying to figure out where in the code base this lives and how it's actually being used. So there's, there's a lot left to be desired here as well. So if you're an organization where you feel like these tools aren't solving your existing problem, this problem for your uh, program, uh, think of it this way. Like, you see, if our if you see in our disclosed CVEs over the years, only two to four percent of them are actually high risk. In the same study, you can see that only a small fraction are actually high risk every single year. Uh, so really, the big question is, how do I, you know, what do I do to figure out the two to four percent that are high risk, and how can I effectively save my time and still remediate these open vulnerabilities? So. One of the ways that we have came across at Simgra is this concept called reachability. And by no means is this novel or new, it's, it's a concept that's out there uh, in white papers and other companies have been exploring it too, but it's something that really works well for us and the way Simgra is built. And I'll get into that a little bit later uh, with some examples. But reachability analysis is essentially this. If you're checking to see if a package is vulnerable based off of its version, you'll extend that by also checking to see if you're using that package in a vulnerable way within your actual code. So, the, and, the, and the really quickly, why this is so helpful is we did a study where if we just checked for the package version, we see that, hey, about 900 packages are vulnerable, right? We see that they're within this version range as described by the CVE, and we see that your important package, 900. But if we take a look at you know, the actual reachability, what makes this package and the usage of that package vulnerable, uh, you get that down to roughly about like in the tens, right? So that's roughly like a one to 90 ratio, 1% uh, of your total number of output. So that is crazy. If this theoretically can be applied to in your everyday uh, tool, everyday uh, security program, that is a massive time gain to be had. So uh, just wanna keep this, uh, bring this to the forefront. Reachability is something that we've explored could possibly help. And this brings me over to SEMGRIP supply chain. So what, what is it exactly? In short, we're a dependency scanner that detects vulnerabilities in third-party packages. Uh, and we leverage this reachability analysis uh, to help you hone in on the high quality ones. So we look beyond just your package and your version from the manifest files, uh, but we also scan your code files to make sure, hey, you're also using this in a vulnerable way. And the intention behind there is 
we start with thousands of vulnerabilities each month uh, from the slide earlier. We get this down to tens of high quality findings that we are absolutely confident that you need to focus on. And the net result is you save a lot of time by not having to dig through every single one looking for the needle in the haystack. You just we just tell you where the needle is you can go in and grab it and fix it right there. Um, so that's essentially the basis and the motivation for how SEMGRUP supply chain came to be. And so SEMGRUP supply chain uh, uses reachability analysis in a pretty simple two-step process. So um, our first step is pretty similar to what folks have been doing. We first scan your lock file or your manifest file to get information about your dependencies. Um, from there, once we have a picture of what you're importing, uh, what pin versions you have, we'll then use SEMGRUP's open source engine, uh, which we use to scan your actual code files themselves. And from there, we'll grab for the patterns and look for pieces from the CVE that uh, actually show how this package is vulnerable. So if you take a look in the diagram on the right, really briefly, what that means is we'll look in your package lock JSON to see if you're importing popular library. And then we'll also look in your JS files to see if you're actually using utility function A, assuming there's a CVE that says utility function A is vulnerable. Um, I know, so I know this diagram is, you know, just an example. Let's actually take a look at a real life example and see where this, uh, where this actually uh, comes into play. So let's take a look at prototype pollution in Lodash Merge. So on our right, we have a snippet of a SEMGRUP supply chain rule. Um, there's a lot of text, but really the two main pieces are uh, right here. Uh, let me show. So new, two main pieces are here and over here, where uh, we have a metadata field that checks to see, hey, you're importing Lodash merge uh, under 4.6.2. And then we have a pattern that checks to see if you're importing Lodash in all the many ways that you can import things in JavaScript. Uh, and then also to see if you're actually calling the merge function itself. So, uh, oops. Oops. So over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, so over here, uh, you can see like, hey, uh, we are calling merge. Uh, we are importing Lodash in line three, and then we're actually calling the merge function here uh, with a malicious object that pollutes Proto. Um, so yeah, that's one example of how it works. Here's another one. Uh, SEMGRUP supply chain works uh, more than just in JavaScript. We also do Ruby, for example. So here we have a uh, CVE for uncontrolled resource consumption in Nokukiri, which checks to see if if you have ill-formed HTML markup, uh, and if you're parsing that, uh, you might get some out-of-memory errors. So again, in our SEMGRUP rule, we'll check to see if you're importing Nokikiri under 1.13.4, and then also checking to see if you are you know, actually parsing any HTML. Uh, so if we go here, we can see, hey, we detect in your code, after we detect that you're importing Nokikiri, that you're trying to parse HTML, that's a reachable finding. We detected these two conditions. This is for sure something that's uh, vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. So, really, that was those are that's basically what reachability is. We're just extending. We're just looking for an additional check beyond just looking for package inversion. Um, but we think the ramifications are pretty huge. So, I just have a sample snippet of my SEMGREP projects and uh, number of vulnerabilities. I have 19 projects and I have over 300 vulnerabilities across them. Using this reachability analysis, I was able to cut that down to 50. Um, so this isn't quite the one to 99 ratio that uh, I showed you earlier, uh, but I think the concept here still is true. We are taking a huge number of huge pool of vulnerabilities that you have to go deal with. Um, you have to give a report on what's actually bad. And we're really just honing in on the ones that we are very confident in 
are actually vulnerable. So, uh, you know, 325 to 50, it's a first step. Uh, we're constantly improving our product to make sure that this accuracy is even more fine-tuned and that we're actually surfacing things that are truly vulnerable. Um, and yeah, I mentioned earlier that SEMgrep is pretty powerful and we're constantly adding new languages. Uh, we do more, we do support more than just JavaScript and Ruby. So we, we currently do Python, Go, and Java as well. And because of how language generic uh, SEMgrep tools can be, and uh, how our SEMgrep engine is actually built, we can actually scale our coverage to cover a lot more than just the languages we have. So uh, on our roadmap, we also have PHP and C-sharp, and they'll be coming out later this year. Um, but I thought it was important to point this out because you know, some tools might just be limited to one language, but we think in order to really secure your open source dependencies, you need to be able to have a really comprehensive polyglot coverage. Apps today are more than just a single language. They're usually a composition of many different ones. Cool. So I know we talked through a lot. Let's just do a quick recap so we can context load what we've learned so far. So we've learned that in, for third-party packages, it's really hard to patch everything to latest versions. Uh, there's tons of open, vul open vulnerabilities that uh, get flagged as a result. Triaging all of them is super time consuming and there's no realistic way someone will go through their entire backlog and get everything done and get to inbox zero on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, if existing tools aren't solving this problem well, reachability could be a concept to help you uh, address that. So some group supply chain today leverages reachability and we look beyond your lock files and manifest files. Uh, we look to check to see your vulnerable code patterns in your code files as well. And then it's also easy to scale coverage and support uh, across different ecosystem and package management systems. So yeah, that is a quick recap in a nutshell of uh, what we've gone through so far. Um, before we get into the demo, I see that there are a couple questions. So uh, I'll try to use, I'll try to get through some of them too. Cool. So Magno asked, why not use some of SAS itself to scan for bones in OSS packages? Ah, so that's precisely what we're doing. We just, there are basically some of SAS rules that we added a little extra metadata field below to also check for uh, the package version in your log files as well. So we do leverage uh, some of SAS, the open source engine to do that. Cool. Uh, Daniel asked, does this handle transit dependencies? Um, so currently today in some supply chain, we also flag you flag for you uh, any transit dependencies uh, that we uh, scan because we scan your entire lock file and we also grab the transitivity information from there. Uh, we don't have reachability for transit dependencies today, but it's on our roadmap and will be a beta version will come out live uh, at the end of this year. Um, anonymous attendee asked, uh, SEMgrep supply chain solution reach is within a user's own source code, uh, i.e. it checks more context of the open source vulnerability impacts. Uh, yeah, so I'll actually go over how that actually works, but we do check uh, your own source code because uh, we scan your uh, code files as well. Sean asked, is the product goal to provide a stronger signal for prioritization of what to upgrade first? Or is the goal to create a confident false positive signal for what is safe to ignore? Uh, I'd say it's the former. We we just wanna give, we're not saying anything that's unreachable isn't something you should not fix, uh, but we wanna give you a stronger signal of, hey, we see that you're actually using something today for this direct dependency, you should go fix this first. Um, how do you plan to achieve the 90% SCA vuln reduction you mentioned earlier? Uh, another question by Magno. Uh, we, our roadmap for doing this is fine tuning reachability. So we actually have a team of security researchers that goes in and really digs deep into the CV to understand why is this vulnerable, package vulnerable and like what exact behavior exhibited will make this uh, vulnerable. So uh, 
once we do that research, they translate that into our SEM group rules. And as our process gets better for uh, putting that reachability analysis into our rules, uh, we, we believe that this 90% reduction is uh, something we already have. If not, we'll be more consistent across users in different uh, code bases. Uh, Ion asked, is some supply chain available on-prem or self-hosted? Uh, we, you can download uh, the SEMGRIP binary, uh, just like SEMGRIP code, uh, on your local machine, and you can uh, have that there. Uh, but we also have a cloud version that I don't think we support uh, on-prem or self-hosted. And then another question uh, from there was also, hey, uh, what, what does a timeline look for a new vulnerability published until a rule is relevant available for the tool? Uh, so we don't have an official SLA out there, but internally we usually have a rule within the same business day um, for example, recently, uh, I think like two days ago, last week, we had a VM2 vulnerability that was flagged and we had a rule out within the afternoon. So we're usually really quick on making sure these rules are out there. Uh, cool. Uh, there, yes, I can jump into the demo. Uh, if there are any more questions, I'll answer them after. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Oops. Awesome. So here we are on our SEMGRIP Cloud platform. This is the web app that we offer as part of our uh, products. Uh, this is where security programs can configure, manage the projects, uh, set up the rules, um, all that good stuff, integrations. But uh, since we're talking about SEMGRIP supply chain today, I'll jump into supply chain first. Now, a lot I saw a lot of the questions revolved around how are we doing this? How do we get these rules and do this. So let me actually jump into our advisories tab and start from there. Cool. So this is our, this is our advisories tab, and this is basically our database of all the CVEs for open source vulnerabilities that we are capturing. Uh, we have a, we depend on GitHub Security Advisory as our source of truth. So every time a new CVE is disclosed, and flagged by them, we'll also have something flagged here. And what happens is all the rules start out as what we call internally a parity rule, where we just check for the package uh, within a certain version range. So this is traditional style uh, SCA vuln detection. You're just looking at the package and you're seeing if it's in a vulnerable range. That's step one. So step two is where we pick and choose which rules we should add in our reachability analysis for. Uh, so generally what this looks like is our security research team will take all the highs and criticals that are disclosed um, since May of 2022, and we'll go ahead and try to dig through and understand what makes this rule reachable. Uh, so sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's just a function call. Uh, other times it might be a little more tricky to figure out how. Sometimes it depends on how your infrastructure is set up or if you're passing in unsanitized input. But roughly, this is what a reachability rule looks like. We do the same thing where we check to see if you're importing Lang chain here within this range. But then we'll also have this pattern section that we scan against your code files to make sure that, hey, are you actually exhibiting this pattern and this behavior? Uh, so. Let's say we ran this out in the wild in your code. If we saw something that matches this pattern, we'll flag it as a reachable finding. But then if we don't, we'll flag it as an unreachable one where you're still importing the package, but we don't detect anything that shows you're using it today in a bad way. And that's basically it for our rules. We are we we launched SEMGRAP supply chain back in October. Uh, we're constantly getting people to uh, add in and help us expand how we build out reachability analysis across all rules. But roughly, it's we make sure that all the highs and criticals that are disclosed uh, have some sort of reachability analysis for them. Cool. I'm going to jump right into our vulnerabilities tab. Uh, and let's go through like a typical day and uh, what this looks like. So let's say you're using some supply chain. 
you just got a notification that you got a you ran a daily scan and you got a bunch of findings. So I can see here that I have 103 vulnerabilities across seven projects. Now, I don't really want to sit here and triage 103 vulnerabilities. I have 15 other meetings to go to today. I have a lot of PRDs to write up. I can only get through like a few that are actually important. So what reachability analysis does is, again, we really hone in on the ones that we're confident actually show you something vulnerable. So I'm going to go ahead and filter to only the reachable ones. And uh, you can see that we went down to just 13 vulnerabilities across five projects from 103. Uh, so now let's actually take a look at what one of these reachable vulnerabilities looks like. So here we have, you know, what you're probably familiar with. We tell you the rating based, the severity based off of the CVSS score. We reference the CVE. We tell you this is improper input validation Lodash. Uh, we tell you what version you're importing. And if you click here, it will actually jump to the lock file that we detected it at. Uh, but the main thing that we want to show you here is where exactly this is reachable. So we can see that this is reachable via one usage. So let's actually click into it and see what happens. Cool. So I jumped into here, and this is the screenshot I took earlier in the slides. But you can see, hey, we saw that you're importing Lodash here. And we can actually highlight the specific line where you're calling dot .merge in a vulnerable way. because you're polluting uh, proto here. So this point to code sort of feature that we have is really to help you build confidence, to help you and your developers build confidence that whatever we're finding is actually something that's vulnerable. From there, you can go ahead and, all right, now I'm confident that this is an actual vulnerability. I'm going to go ahead and go upgrade this. Or I can go ahead and, you know, if I don't have time, I can ignore it for one of these reasons, whether it's a false positive, acceptable risk, no time to fix. Um, it's kind of like a two-way feedback door. We have higher confidence that this is a vulnerability, but sometimes there might be extra circumstances that make it not so. So we want to make sure you can still have the option to manage and deal with this and give us feedback as well. Cool. And I think that's roughly what uh, a typical workflow you would see if you were just managing your uh, reachable vulnerabilities. We also show you your unreachable vulnerabilities, again, not because they're like fully, like not uh, fully safe, but more so these are just ones you can look at later because we want you to focus on the reachable ones first. And as you can see, there's quite a bit. So you want to just focus on the ones that have more signal uh, that are, that it's actually vulnerable. And I think there was a question earlier about whether we support transitive or not. Um, we also do that here as well. And you can, there's a little tab right here, a little pill that tells you if it's a transit dependency or not. Awesome. I think there, there are a couple more things I want to show on this UI uh, before I uh, jump over to something else. Um, cool. So let's say you guys are curious about what happens about a vulnerability, for, but there's no CV or rule that's been disclosed yet? Uh, so if you saw something on Twitter or hunter.dev, what you can actually go is go to this tab called dependencies. Uh, and this is basically uh, our way to let you on-demand query across your entire code base for dependencies that you have. So I don't know. Uh, let's say I'm looking to see if I have Jinja 2, right? So uh, cool. I can see I have Jinja 2. Uh, let's see if I have it under 3.1.0. So cool. We support ranges and exact versions, and we can tell exactly. Awesome. I have one repository in one lock file where I'm actually importing Jinja 2. And so this isn't to replace reachability, uh, but this is more so to help you build confidence that we're scanning everything we say we scan and to help you find these uh, zero day bones that are just disclosed in case of like a black swan event, you know, we don't, you want to get ahead of the curve for the next log for J and you don't really want to not have any insight into that. So dependency intelligence is also important here. Uh, cool. So I think I spent a lot of time going over what 
a workflow would look like for a security engineer on our cloud platform. But I actually want to show, hey, like, how does this work for developers? You know, a lot of folks have told us that they don't want developers to leave GitHub or GitLab. They really just want to make sure that they have these findings wherever they're coding and they can do something about it and, and shift left, you know, kill the time in the, mi in the middle process and just uh, jump right into it. So I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. Uh, here I'm over on GitHub and I have a test repo uh, supply chain demo uh, and I made a PR for this. So what we actually do, if you guys are familiar with SEMGRIP SAS, we do this thing called PR comments. Uh, and we do that for some group supply chain as well. So this is an example of what it looks like. We'll flag, you know, what we see as a reachable finding. Uh, we'll tell you the risk. So, hey, like Nokogiri before 1.13 is uh, vulnerable to catastrophic backtracking. We'll tell you the fix. So what is the latest patch version? Uh, where is the relevant mock file for this? And then we'll also give you a set of references for your developer to actually go and confirm and go and learn more about this vulnerability. So why is it an actual issue uh, and why is it flagging this here and now? Again, we want to make sure that our goal is to build trust and really be transparent about how we're finding, making these findings. And the end result really is just to help you save time with reachability. Like we'll surface everything for you. We'll help you build trust that we're flagging the right things. We want to help save you time because this problem is so persistent and widespread across the industry. Um, and that's, yeah, this is what developers would typically see. I'm going to jump back into these slides. Uh, I have one more uh, before we can open it up to Q&A. Uh, but a lot of folks, you know, if you're curious if supply chain works for you, I mentioned earlier that we have uh, we have coverage for a lot of languages and soon to be more. Uh, but we also work off of the same integrations and uh, SCM integrations as SEMGRIP code uh, as our SaaS product. So uh, that means you can integrate this in the same exact way through GitHub Actions, Jenkins, Circle CI, et cetera. Uh, you can also use GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. Uh, and then we also have email and Slack notifications for reachable supply chain findings. So if you want to get a heads up on when any of this stuff happens, you can have this right at the uh, hand of your fingertips. Um, cool. And lastly, uh, we have a couple of resources. So if any, again, I I said that there's a one to, there's a 90% reduction. This could vary from code base to code base. So I actually encourage folks to try this out themselves. Uh, we have a SEMGRIP code and supply chain trial. So if you go ahead and uh, scan this QR code or go to one of the Go links, you can actually activate this trial and try it yourself. And I'm always open to feedback and making this a two-way door. So I'd love to hear what folks uh, say after their first usage. If you want to hear how this product is being used from like a practitioner's point of view, uh, one of my good coworkers, Kurt, I uh, wrote a blog post, uh, a deep dive blog post. So you can also check that out. Um, and if you want to learn more about the product in general, uh, what other customers, what other users are saying, uh, how it's helped them, you can check out our product page uh, in this third link below. And there are some references there. Mm -hmm.